Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, a show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in. I'm your host, Ivana, and today we're joined by Dr. Timothy Clary, ICR research scientist and geologist. It's a pleasure to chat with you again, Dr. Clary. Well, again, it's great to be here. Yes. Well, Dr. Clary, we wanted to talk to you about an historical event, one that occurred in 1980, and then, of course, it happened later, and we're talking about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Can you tell us what happened? Well, I'm going to age date myself here, but I was only (laughs) a young geology student at the time that went off back in 1980, so it was May 18th, 1980. Mm -hmm. There was this massive eruption, but there was many months preceding that where geologists kind of knew something was going on Mm -hmm. because there was a lot of little mini eruptions, steam, smoke Mm -hmm. coming out, earthquakes, volcanoes. And so a lot of volcanologists, geologists that study volcanoes, Mm -hmm. were kind of monitoring around the volcano itself. And they didn't, you know, kind of see what they could learn if it was going to erupt, how big the eruption would be. They really had no idea. Mm -hmm. And it kind of surprised them on May 18th when it just, violently erupted. Yeah. But what really set the volcano off was a massive landslide because it was a bulge that was building up in the north side. So you had this bulge of magma that was coming in and it was kind of building a big bump on the side. Wow. And so it got over steepened. And then the day of the eruption, the moment of the eruption, first thing that set it off was a big landslide that removed all that rock. Mm-hmm. And then the volcano blasted violently to the north and then blasted upwards as well. But that wow. violent blast to the north Killed a lot of people, killed over 50 people. Uh, many of them were scientists studying the volcano. They didn't think they would be killed, but right. it blasted everything up for about five miles in that direction to the north. Yeah. And people think volcanoes erupt upwards only, but mm-hmm. in this case, because of that landslide that set it off, there was this massive blast to the north. And yeah. that really was the devastating part. It kind of destroyed about 250 or 300 square miles of area and set off this massive pyrocaustic flow. After the debris flow from that landslide, mm-hmm. there was this pyrocaustic flow, which is hot ash and kind of moving at hurricane speed. So stuff's coming at you at 100 right. miles an hour. You see this little dense cloud, and you can't out really run those things. They're moving so fast. You just mm-hmm. hope that you're far enough away where they finally run out of mm-hmm. their, literally their steam as they're, as they're moving along. So this blast came out, killing everything in its path, kind of scorching it because it's yeah. still like a 1,000 degree kind of coming at you and Mm -hmm. really, really dangerous. Similar thing happened at Pompeii. Mm -hmm. Mount Vesuvius erupted the same sort of thing. There was a series of these pyrocaustic flows that came down and Mm -hmm. killed everybody. It just kind of so hot, so fast. Mm -hmm. You don't have a chance. If he hadn't gotten away by then. And Mount St. Helens, the people that were there monitoring it, you know, they didn't have a chance to get away. So many of them did die. But it was this major blast. And and the debris flow itself Mm -hmm. from the landslide displaced the water in, in Spirit Lake on the north side of Mount St. Helens so violently that it caused the water to lift up out of the lake, stripping off all these trees on the north side of Spirit Lake. Mm-hmm. Just the sheer force of the water by being pushed out so quickly from that landslide mm-hmm. sheared off all these about a million trees. And many of those trees, even today, 40 years and more after the eruption, are still floating around on Spirit Lake, you can still see the this mm-hmm. tree mat, this log mat that still floats around. And so it was a very, very devastating uh, eruption because it was a subduction zone volcano. Subduction zone volcanoes, because of the subduction of those ocean crust, and some of it does melt as it comes back up, a little bit of the sediments mm-hmm. going down in a subduction zone, creates a magma that is very, very explosive. Mm-hmm. And so you go across the, the ocean like Hawaii, they're not very explosive. They don't mm-hmm. really erupt catastrophically. Uh-huh. There's just a lot of lava that pours out. Iceland, the same thing. But these volcanoes like Mount Vesuvius, Mount St. Helens, you know, all the Cascade Mountains, the Aleutians, many of these volcanic chains around the world are actually subduction zone volcanoes mm-hmm. that formed. Many of them started forming in the flood, late in the flood year, we believe as creation geologists. Mm-hmm. And as these volcanoes formed, of course, they still have occasional eruptions. So Mount St. Helens is, is kind of one in a, in a series of those that runs along the northern, mm-hmm. northwest United States coast. But it's, it was a very, very violent eruption, and, and it taught geologists a lot of things. It really mm-hmm. showed that catastrophic activity does occur. Prior to 1980, right. geology was taught 
everything's slow, methodical, slow, methodical. The mm -hmm. whole idea of what they call uniformitarianism, mm -hmm. where everything is uniform, everything's slow, slow erosion, slow deposition. You know, a few feet of sediment might take a thousand years, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's been the idea they taught since the late 19th century. But with Mount St. Helens, they realized, wow, things can happen fast. Yeah. There are catastrophes that happen. Mm -hmm. And so they had, even the secular old earth geologists uh, had to admit that occasionally there are catastrophes that do a lot. They do a lot of deposition. Mount St. Helens deposited in some places hundreds of feet of sediment in, in volcanic debris because of that mm -hmm. debris flow and the ash settling out and, and all this material will settle out. So you get rapid deposition. Within a day, you may get 20, 30, 40 feet Wow. Of material within just a couple hours mm -hmm. depositing. So, uh, Mossy Helens showed that, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you can get rapid deposition 20, 10, 20, 30 feet of sediment almost instantly. Yeah. And then two years later, mm -hmm. there was another little eruption yeah. that melted the ice cap that was building up at Mossy Helens and that kind of flowed down. The smaller eruption carved a big canyon through some of those sediments that were just deposited, plus some of the earlier sediments and rocks that were there. Mm -hmm. And carved a canyon about one fortieth the scale of Grand Canyon, and so he, can sh he shows that not only can you get rapid deposition of mm -hmm. sediments and volcanic material that kind of line up like sediments, mm -hmm. but you can get erosion through solid rock and, and some of these sediments that were just deposited in previous eruptions very very quickly as well, just with water, the force of water. Can and how do long things. did that take? That again just took hours, just several mm -hmm. hours to, for that to happen. Yeah, or at, you could argue maybe a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But uh, very, very, very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, that's why Mount St. Helens as a whole is, is a great laboratory. Right. Because it really shows things can happen fast under the right conditions. You can get rapid deposition, mm -hmm. rapid erosion. And also the danger that we don't really understand how dangerous these volcanoes are. You know, many scientists were killed because of the blast went to the north right. because of that bulge coming out and that whole side of the mountain gave way. And then something like 1,500 feet at the top of Mount St. Helens blew off. And so there's a big yeah. gaping hole there now where it used to be a little more pyramid-shaped, mm -hmm. and now it's kind of got this big crater up there. Wow. But one interesting thing that, that actually happened is uh, uh, ICR's former geologist, Steve Austin, went up there 10 years after the eruptions in the 80s, went up the next decade in the 90s, and he sampled some of that new magma that had just cooled, the big dome that was coming up in the middle. Okay. And he sampled some of that rock sent off to laboratories to age date the rocks and see what those age dates would come back as. And the, he did two different techniques. One was just a couple minerals in there, and some of it was the whole rock. And we saw the eruption. Everybody has video of it. We know when this volcano right. erupted, yet the rocks came back from these laboratories saying they're, one technique said like 230,000 years old, wow. and the other said like 2.4 million years old. Wow. So you're looking at ranges of between hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, Mm -hmm. Yet we know that rock was only about 10 years old. Right. So to me, that kind of shows, the, the again, the fallacies in age dating. Right. Is like any age date is always assumed to be a fact, but yet when we test it against known eruptions, mm -hmm. and we've done this in Hawaii, we've done this in Italy, secular scientists have done this as well, and mm -hmm. they almost never get the right answer. Wow. Even though we know historically when mm -hmm. that erupted. And yet we're supposed to believe age dates are correct, they're are real, and you know, there's just way too many assumptions built into those. Mm -hmm. So Mount St. Helens kind of taught us that as well because yeah. that was some research that ICR did uh, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but it still holds true that age dates are shown to be just kind of out of whack. And you can't believe every age date you get. Mm -hmm. yeah, again, I challenge the, the listeners to, to look these numbers up. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the 60s where secular, you know, regular uniformitarian geologists have done tests on all across the world unknown eruptions, and they get almost none of the dates show up correct. They're way off by millions of years, yeah. sometimes even more. So that wasn't really too surprising, mm -hmm. but we, you know, I still wanted to kind of see. But again, Mount St. Helens, the, the two most amazing things about it is it showed and changed really the way geologists, even, you know, atheistic geologists, nobody believes in God at all, uh, they all realize now that there are catastrophes that took place. Mm -hmm. And they did great things. They can deposit things rapidly, not just volcanic material, but, but they can deposit sediments rapidly as well. And secondly, you can have rapid erosion from just water. Mm -hmm. and so under the right conditions, you can form things at the Grand Canyon from the receding phase of the flood. You can form the deposits, the sediments of Grand Canyon from the flood 
as the water rose higher and higher and higher. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not a problem to deposit thousands of feet of sediment in a short amount of time, right. like we see pretty much all over the world today, that we would say is part of the flood. Mm-hmm. We, the old earth geologists try to say these took millions of years for each layer to be deposited. But we're seeing the evidence in the right conditions you can get real rapid deposition and then, of course, real rapid erosion. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, speaking of the flood and you, you bringing that up, how can we draw parallels between the two as far as, you know, this is just a micro uh, form mm-hmm. of that, but how do we draw those parallels? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you can look at the parallels between the, the, the erosion at, at Mount St. Helens. You can say it's a 140th the scale. And you're like, well, it's a 40th of the scale, but it's still pretty significant mm-hmm. in just a few hours' time or a few days' time. And so the, the course of the flood, you have a whole year to do all this activity mm-hmm. and as the receding phase took about half that year, so you have a lot of erosion at the surface on your way down as well. Mm-hmm. But what we see around the world is we see continuous layers. We don't see a lot of erosion in between the layers. Mm-hmm. And so we see these flat layers and flat layers and flat layers. Secular guys or uniformitarian geologists say there's, you know, millions of years between these layers, but yet they look like bricks, you know, brick upon brick upon brick. There's mm-hmm. no evidence of any erosion. All the erosion is from the surface down. Right. Just like we see the surface at Mount St. Helens, the erosion took place from the surface down. We see Grand Canyon and other major canyons around the world in Greenland and in Antarctica forming from the surface down. Mm -hmm. And so these seem to be from the receding phase of the flood. That makes the most sense. But you don't see them throughout the rock record. Mm -hmm. You should see canyons filled in with sediments all over the world, but we don't see any of that. And so some of this, what we see at Mount St. Helens can be related back to the bigger scale that took place during the flood year. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's more and more evidence coming out in a kind of unrelated note, but yet on the same topic. They're studying flume experiments now, and they're showing that clay, instead of being deposited, you know, a, the width of a dime every thousand years in the deep ocean, mm-hmm. they're showing that clay to get the laminations, the really thin layers that we see in the rocks, have to be deposited by moving water, moving like a foot or two per second. So Mm -hmm. not extremely high velocities, but they have to be deposited by moving water. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, turning the uniformitarian scientists kind of on end. They don't know how to explain that, but that's what we're seeing. When we do the science, when people are actually, and this is secular scientists doing this, they show that even clay is deposited rapidly by water, and limestone's the same thing. You know, those are always arguments where they used to argue against us creation geologists, say, well, clay takes, you know, so much clay takes, you know, thousands of years or millions of years. Because they think it just settles out of water slowly like we see mm-hmm. happening today. But in, to form these thin laminations that we see, even at St. Helens we see these thin laminations between the volcanic sediments, you have to have moving material. Moving material at a certain velocity makes these laminations. It doesn't just slowly settle out. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that show that mm-hmm. what we thought was slow is actually under the right conditions can happen very, very fast. Right. Dr. Clary, you talked about the, the trees coming after the um, explosion or the eruption, excuse me, and they're in spirit lake. And some of them are actually vertical. Is that true or how does that work? Yeah, most of the, most of the logs got ripped off from the water kind uh-huh. of sliding up the slope from that landslide. And as they went up the slope, they sheared the trees off and they sheared the trees. Right. All the bark kind of got ripped off as they got jostled around. A lot of the bark's gone. The branches are gone. It got, a lot of that got kind of burned off as well from the mm-hmm. big debris flows and things. Uh, but what happened was they got brought back, and many of them still have a, a wider end, even to the trunks. And so most mm-hmm. of what we have is the, is the tree trunks. And the, the tree trunks, some of them actually get waterlogged, and the heavier sides will actually sink down. Mm-hmm. Even though there's not really roots anymore, you can still see there's a, there's a wider side of the trees. And so some of these actually sank into the sediments at different levels. And so over mm-hmm. the last 40 years, we see, even in the first few years, we started seeing trees kind of sinking into the mud below, and they did some imaging of the, of the rocks, uh, and you can actually see, and Steve Austin went actually down there, kind of risked his life a little ways mm-hmm. because the trees can kind of close up gaps and hit them if they blow around too much, but he went down and looked at some of the trees mm-hmm. and actually looked at some of these sinking in the sediment. And what's amazing is if you go to Yellowstone National Park, mm-hmm. there's 27 different tree levels where we see these volcanic debris uh, layers of volcanic material mm-hmm. that we believe erupted late in the flood years. The waters were receding, and you see these trees at 27 different levels. So the secular or old earth geologists say, well, that was 27 different eruptions over you know thousands of years of time, if not more. Mm-hmm. But you can get different levels as these trees sort of settle out. Mm-hmm. 
And so you get a little more sediment going on. The trees are sinking from the water above, and they're coming dropping down as they get waterlogged, the heavy side down. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to Specimen Ridge, it's called at Yellowstone, we actually see trees, yeah. petrified trees today, the thicker, wider sides down, but there's no roots. Mm -hmm. And even in coal seams, another analogy you can make from these uh, tree mat at Spirit Lake is we believe that's probably how coal seams were formed during the flood. And we see the bottoms of coal seams, the tops of coal seams are always perfectly flat. You know, secular mm -hmm. scientists say that coal forms because you drew cre trees were going in place and, they're, you know, over thousands of years they kind of s get buried over somehow sea level rose again, mm -hmm. buried these trees that grew in place, but we don't see any rooting at the bottom. Mm -hmm. We do see occasionally a, a vertical tree mm -hmm. because some of these trees kind of got transported in. Some of them stuck up a little bit as well. But most of the coal, we believe, was what we call alactinous. It was transported in. It's a big fancy word in geology. Yeah. But it means they were transported. And mm -hmm. there's no, that's why we see flat rocks above uh, and below. Even the bottom of the coal seams and the top of the coal seams are perfectly flat, just like bricks. You know, mm -hmm. if you were to lay out bricks and bricks, you see sediment, coal, and then you see more sediments on top. And so we think this is kind of an analogy, again, to how coal forms. Strip the vegetation off as the floodwaters rose higher, mm -hmm. and this big vegetation mat got buried sort of all at once or in mass. Mm -hmm. And then you bury it underneath enough sediment, and it gets cooked enough, it becomes coal. And that mm -hmm. explains the flat tops and the flat bottoms with no rooting going on. They right. didn't really grow in place. They were transported in places. The floodwaters got mm -hmm. higher and higher. And so in some ways it explains, and even at Yellowstone, the National Park Service changed some of their signage because of this discovery at Mount St. Helens oh, wow. that showed, you know, you can get all these trees mm -hmm. all deposited from the same eruption the same year. And, and there's been some studies done that show the tree rings are all the same in many of these trees. And so the same pattern is there showing these trees were probably all alive at the same time. Right. They were stripped off. And they just slowly settled in at different depths as the sediment was coming in rapidly. Mm -hmm. You get different trees. It looks like there's 27 different levels. In fact, there is, but those levels all formed within the same probably major eruption. Okay. And they just, you have a lot of sedimentation, mm -hmm. rapid sedimentation going on, trees dropping in here and there. You get these, what looks like standing trees, but there's no roots. Right. And so it shows that it really didn't grow there at all. There. But to me, the, the best part about it is, is the Spirit Lake kind of gives us a vision of what probably what the, how coal formed during mm -hmm. the flood. Massive amounts of vegetation were stripped yeah. off the land and buried in these sediments as the floodwaters rose higher and higher, and you get these coal seams all over the earth. Yeah, that's. I think that's really um, important for us to mm -hmm. point out is how all of this mm -hmm. just pointed to catastrophic mm -hmm. events. And so if that's just a small scale. If the flood, mm -hmm. the global flood was true, it was global mm -hmm. and catastrophic, then obviously we would see that. The same things that we saw at Mount St. Mm -hmm. Helens, we would see that. So thank you so much um, for joining us today, Dr. Cleary. I feel like you've given us really great insights as to how the eruption um, just gives so many more proofs for what creation science claims. And of course, to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you for being here as well. You can find this podcast on YouTube or anywhere you stream your podcast. Don't forget to subscribe for our future episodes as well as give us a review and rating. And if you had any questions about this topic or other topics, send us a message on social media. But I will leave us here. My name is Ivana, and we'll see you guys next time on the Creation Podcast.